Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Hey, real quick, one other quick announcement that we didn't have in the videos. If this is your, your first time joining with us today, we are truly honored that you chose to be here with us. Uh, we hope that you felt welcomed in the presence of God the moment you pulled into our parking lot. That's why we have people out there, even when it's cold, because we want you to experience God's presence and know that we're excited for you to be here the moment you pull in the parking lot. Uh, all we want from you today is if you could do us one favor, there's a card in the seat in front of you, a red card says, uh, get connected or you know some kind of connection information, something along those lines on there. Fill out that card. I don't know exactly what the card says, but it asks for your information. We can agree on that part. Fill out that card, or you can simply text the word guest to 215-529-6422. It'll send you a digital version of that Connect card. Regardless of how you do that, we'd love to just have you stop out the new here booth, which is right out those doors. We have a free gift for you as our way of saying thank you, answer any questions you have. But we are just honored that you chose to be here with us today. Uh, you came kind of at a weird time because this is at the very end of a sermon series. We'll be starting our Christmas sermon sermon series next week. We're in the, the eighth part of our sermon series going through the book of Philippians. How many of you have enjoyed going through the book of Philippians? Anybody you've been here the, the whole time? Man, I, I really enjoy when we are able to take the time like we have done throughout the series to go through a, a whole book of the Bible, kind of verse by verse, idea by idea, and really kind of break down what it means for us as followers of Christ today. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been looking at this letter to the church in the, uh, of Philippi and, and really kind of breaking it down. And so today we're going to be in chapter four, the final chapter of the book of Philippians. We're not going to be covering the entire chapter, but we're going to cover a pretty large chunk of the chapter. We're going to be in verses 4 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn there, um, I would invite you to do that at this time. This sermon that we're talking about today as we wrap up the series uh, could possibly be, it probably is, the most practical of the entire sermon series. It's something that every single person that's in this room today, not one of you, uh, doesn't understand what we're talking about today. Every single person that's in this room today uh, can relate to the topic that we're going to be talking about today. Quick poll, I want you to, we, we need some participation at this point, all right? I know you might be tired, it's winter, right? But I, I need you to participate. If not, we're all going to look at you and we're going to point at you. So real quick, raise your hand. Uh, if you've ever dealt with any stress in your life. Now, anybody's hand, keep your hands up for a second, look around. Is there anybody whose hand's not up? They're lying. They're lying. Listen, if you went through this year, 2020, and you haven't dealt with any stress, please raise your hand. You are Jesus, and we all want to be your friend. Come on, raise, anybody? <laughs> Nobody. No, no hand was up because the reality is every single one of us have, have dealt with this topic. Even children deal with stress. I have a, my, my oldest daughter, she's in third grade. I, can, I was just thinking about it. It's not even in my notes, but I was thinking about this. Um, you know, I don't even know if it was earlier this year or it was late last year. The one day she was just really, really emotional. Like I don't, she was just having one of those days. Any of your kids ever have one of those days? There's really, like she was just emotional about everything. She was just crying all the time. She was yelling at her brothers and sisters. She was just really, really emotional. And finally I go, Leighton, what is, what's wrong? Like what is going on? Why are you acting the way you're acting? I'm just so stressed out. Like you're eight, what are you stressed about? But like, it's just reality. Like everybody deals with stress. We all, there's not a person in this room that is, that is, that is guaranteed that they're not gonna have stress in life that you can, in fact, there's nothing you can do to live a stress-free life. Stress is just a natural part of, of life. It's something that we all deal with. But if we don't learn to deal with it the right way, it can have some really negative effects on our life. And if we don't learn how to deal with our stress and notice our stress and notice when, we are, notice when we are not just stressed, but we are overstressed, and we don't learn to take control of that and deal with it the right way, it can have super negative effects on our lives. Let me give you a couple symptoms of being overstressed. As I was kind of studying this week, I was looking on WebMD. Anybody, will look, don't look on WebMD, you feel like you're dying. You always feel like you're dying if you look on, like you're gonna find something that shows that you're dying. But regardless, I was looking up different uh, symptoms of being overstressed. And here's just some symptoms. Really, it affects every part of your life. There's emotional symptoms, becoming easily agitated, frustrated and moody, feeling overwhelmed like you are losing control, uh, having difficulty relaxing and quieting your mind. Anybody ever deal with any of those things? Low self-esteem and feelings of loneliness and, and worthlessness, or there's physical symptoms, things like low energy and headaches and upset stomach and aches and pains and tense. I thought those were all just symptoms of getting older, but apparently they're stress symptoms. Chest pain and rapid heartbeat, insomnia, frequent colds and infections, uh, clenched jaw and grinding teeth. Anybody you grind your teeth? You sleep with a mouth guard? 
Do you actually do it? Because my dentist told me to get one, but I'm cheap. So I'm gonna get one of those Walmart ones to solve the problem, right? Grinding your teeth apparently is a stressful. I thought it's just because my mouth is used to talking so much during the day that it doesn't stop (laughs) at night. Cognitive symptoms. It can deal with things like constant worrying, racing thoughts, forgetfulness and disorganization, inability to focus, poor judgment, being pessimistic or seeing only the negative side. Behavioral symptoms. Changes in appetite, either not eating, which sounds like a good problem, right? Some of us, that could be a good symptom, or eating too much. How many of you put on the COVID-19 during this year? How about the COVID-20? Any, do I see 25? Any COVID-20? Some of us, well, let's be real, like when we struggle with, with stress, at least, you know stress spelled backwards? Desserts. It's true. It's true, which makes a lot of sense, Right? Because when I get stressed, that's what I hit. Find those Oreos that my wife has hidden somewhere, right? Like, I'm going to find them, and I'm going to eat all of them. Desserts, stressed, eating too much, procrastinating, and avoiding responsibilities. Increased use of alcohol, drugs, or cigarettes, or any other substances that we use to numb the pain. These are all symptoms of being overstressed. When we don't, get take, when we don't take care of ourselves and deal with these, these are things that show up in our lives. And here's the thing. These aren't the worst of the problems, When we see these symptoms, these should be like red flags that go off, right? Like shining red lights in our lives that go off and say, you need to get this under control because if you don't get it under control, when we don't get our stress under control, when we allow that stress to keep going in our lives, it leads to long-term problems like mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, uh, personality disorders, cardiovascular disease, including heart disease, high blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythms, heart attacks and stroke, obesity and other eating disorders, skin and hair problems such as acne, psoriasis, eczema and permanent hair loss, gastrointestinal problems. Some of you are just depressed right now. Like I got all these problems. I am so stressed out. The reality is we can see that stress plays a big part in a lot of bad things in our lives. It's it's very, very practical what we're gonna be talking about today because we can plainly and clearly see that stress has the ability to negatively affect every area of our lives. And so the title of the message this morning is simply this, Stress Makes Me a Mess. And the big idea that I want us to see and that I want us to leave here understanding today is if we wanna experience more peace and less stress, how many of you would say that to be true in your life? You wanna experience more peace in your life Anybody? You can, we can participate. You want to experience more peace, yeah? Less stress, then we need to learn to manage our stress God's way. We need to learn to manage our stress God's way. This message this morning is for those of us who feel overwhelmed, who maybe feel at the end of your rope. Is there anybody in here that's like that today? You feel like giving up. You just can't wait for 2020 to be over, hoping that 2021 will be a do-over, right? Our theme this year was breakthrough. Next year is breakthrough 2.0, the remix, right? <laughs> It's not true, but maybe it could be. You just want, like, this, this message this morning hopefully is an encouragement to you, a challenge to you to put this into practice. And so let's look at Philippians chapter four, verse four through 13. As we read this, we're gonna look at five keys to dealing with stress that Paul's gonna give us in this portion of scripture. So we're gonna read the entire portion of scripture and then we're going to pray and then we're gonna break it down. So verse four, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. How I praise the Lord that you are so concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I ever was in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, your word that that changes our lives, your word that never returns void. God, I pray today that your word would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would encourage every single person in this room, especially those of us who are here today, who feel overwhelmed, who are overstressed, 
who are anxious, who feel like giving up. God, I pray that you would give hope to us today, but not only just hope, God, not only just that we would be hearers of your word, but God, we would be doers of your word. We would put into practice what you speak to us and we would experience change in our lives by doing that. And we thank you for that. We invite you into this place today to speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Five keys to dealing with stress. If you're taking notes, the first one we see here is we need to learn to refuse to worry. Refuse to worry. The very first key he tells us is we need to refuse to worry. In verse six, the very, verse, the very first part of verse six, he says this. He says, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. This verse isn't a suggestion but it's a command for us, especially as followers of Christ. We are commanded to choose not to worry. And we have to make a choice in our lives when it comes to worry, because how many of you know, choosing, that actually takes work. Like our natural default, how how many of your natural default is to worry? Anybody? Me as well. Natural default is to worry about stuff. We have to make a choice that we're going to refuse to worry, that we're going to be intentional when it comes to the worries and the things in our lives, that we're not going to worry about them. I want to share a portion of scripture that Jesus spoke uh, in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, a pretty significant portion of this sermon was geared towards this idea of worry. And these were Jesus's instructions in Matthew 6, verse 25 through 34. He says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Is it life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. When Jesus talks about worry in this portion of scripture, he points out a couple things that we need to understand about worry. He says, worry is is unreasonable. We worry about things that we shouldn't be worrying about. We we worry about things that's kind of unreasonable for us to worry about. He says, look at the the birds and, and the flowers. They don't worry about these things. God cares much more about you than these. So why do you worry about these things? You're you're being unreasonable, right? Worry is unnatural. It's unhelpful. It's it's unnecessary. Worry does us no good. Quick question. Raise your hand if you've worried about something and it's made things better. Nobody. I I don't, I, I would say in my own life, there's never been a time where I've worried about something and after worrying about it and stressing about it afterwards, you know, like, you know, I I just spent the last four hours really worried and I feel so much better now. Like I'm, I'm relieved. And like, that's never been the case. Every time I worry about something, I always feel so much worse afterwards after I've worried. It never makes things better at all. It says, because we need to refuse to worry. We need to refuse to hold on to that because it actually does nothing good for us. And it's not how we're supposed to be as, as God's children. When we worry, what we're really doing is we are putting ourselves into God's position in our relationship. We are assuming the position of father when we are supposed to be assuming the position of God's child. When we, when we worry, we are assuming the position of father. How many of you have kids? Any of you, your kids, right? Uh, they don't really worry about much, do they? I mean, some kids worry about some things, but they don't really worry about a lot. Like your kids don't worry every month about like how the bills are gonna get paid. Any of your kids, you put, they put the air up, they know how to turn the thermo, their thermostat. You come home and it's a sauna in your house. Like who set this at 85 degrees? Or when it's hot out, they set the air conditioner at like 64 They don't think about the cost. They don't think about how much the electric, they don't think about any of those things. They just enjoy the the effects of it, right? When you go out to eat, you ask them what they want to eat. They don't look at the menu and go, you know what? I know money's tight this month, so I'm gonna choose the hot dog and french fries. (laughs) They don't think about that. When I was a kid, I definitely did not think about that. I was the kid that whenever we went out to eat, I was like, show me the steak menu. (laughs) Anybody else? The Bible says you reap what you sow. 
I'm not looking. I don't take my kids out of the house for that reason. Won't have any money. They'll be eating steak all the time. My daughter, Leighton, she loves steak. But I was always like that. And here's the thing. My dad would ask, Ryan, do you want the steak? And I wasn't going to disappoint him, right? <laughs> I don't know if he really wanted me to answer yes, but, but in my mind, in my heart, I thought like, if he's asking, he wants me to order the steak. My brother over there settling for a hamburger. He could have steak. He's not enjoying his father's blessings like I am, right? And I would always, I'm not lying, I would literally always order the steak all the time. I never thought about the price. Why? Because it wasn't my bill to pay. I'm just being honest with you. And the same is true when it comes to worry. When we worry about things, we're assuming the position of the father. We're worrying about things that are not our responsibility to worry about. We're worrying about a bill that is not our bill to pay. He says, you're not the father, you're the child. So you give your worries to the father. You're not in the position of having to worry about that bill. That's God's bill to pay. In the Bible, it says it like this. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, give all of your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. In the Old Testament, in Psalms 55, verse 22, it says, cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Really, when it comes to worry, we only have two choices. We can hold on to our worry we can, we, can, we can focus on our worry. We can allow our worry to overwhelm us. We can allow ourselves to be burnt out and stressed out with our worry. Or we can give our worry to our Father, who the Bible says cares about us, loves us, will sustain us, and will not let us be shaken. I don't know about you, but one of those options sounds a lot better than the other. Yet if I'm honest with you, I find myself picking option one all the time. Carrying a burden that I wasn't meant to carry. Holding on to something that I wasn't meant to hold on to. The Bible says, cast your cares on the Lord. But how do we do this? Like, how do we actually put this into practice? Well, that leads to the second key, and that's we need to learn to take it to God in prayer. He goes on to say, don't worry about anything. Instead, right, op the option is, don't worry. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. The cure for worry isn't worrying less. It's praying more. The cure for worrying isn't worrying less, it's praying more. Uh, worry and prayer are really two sides of the same coin. Like, the worry is really, it's like anti-prayer. It's the opposite of prayer, it's negative prayer. Uh, you can worry or you can pray, but you can't really do both of them at the same time. You just can't. Worry negates prayer. How many of you ever noticed that in your life? When you're worrying, it keeps you from praying. Right, All, it just keeps you from, from going to the Lord in prayer. But when you pray, what you realize is as you cast your cares on the Lord and you actually give him your worries and you give him your problems and you actually go to him and you leave them there, it cancels that worry. It takes care of the worry in our lives. And we need to choose when it comes to, to worry, to worry less and to pray more. He says to pray about everything, to tell God what you need. Many of our prayers go unanswered, not because God cannot answer those prayers, but because we refuse to ask anything of God. We refuse to ask him anything. And it's not because he doesn't know. It's not like God's like, you know what? Oh, you know, I, know, I didn't know you needed that. I was wondering if you were gonna ask for that. I mean, like, I, I never knew. No, it's not, God doesn't need us to ask or want us to ask because he, because he doesn't know. But oftentimes, God will wait for us to ask before he answers our prayers because he's waiting for us to participate. And why, why is it that he wants us to ask? Why is he inviting us to ask? Because when we ask God, when we bring our request to God, what it does is it forces us to stop relying on ourselves, to stop trusting ourselves, to stop carrying the weight ourselves, and to give the burden to God. When we make our requests known, it forces us to admit that it's too much for us to handle on our own. And God is big enough to handle our problems. So he says, make your requests known to God. I love how Jesus taught about prayer in Luke chapter 11. So then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. Anybody have a neighbor that's like that? Psst, it's midnight, I need three loaves of bread. What are you doing? Why do you need that much carbs? That's not good for you. You want some gluten-free? So at midnight, you go to a friend's house, you ask for three loaves of friend. Here's the reason. A friend of mine has just arrived from a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. I mean, maybe he wants something more than three loaves of bread, right? You got a weird friend if that's all he wants, but maybe some steak, egg, something else. But regardless, he said, a friend has come, showed up. I need to give him some food. Suppose he calls out from his bedroom, right? This guy doesn't even come to the door. Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night. My family and I are in bed. I can't help you. 
I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. <laughs> like he's not gonna do it because he's your friend. I'm a good friend. I'm gonna get up and get you the three loaves of bread. No, but if you keep knocking and you don't stop annoying him, he's going to get up and give you what you need because of your shameless persistence. And then Jesus goes on to say this. He goes, and so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Pray about everything. Don't stop making your requests known to God. Don't stop asking God what, for what you need. Don't stop telling God what you need. Don't stop seeking God for the things that you need in your life. Keep going to God. Because when we don't go to God in prayer, what we often do is the opposite. We just continue to worry. So keep going to God in prayer so that we refuse to worry. And then the third key that we see in this is we need to learn to develop the attitude of gratitude. What he goes on to say at the end of verse six, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And then, and then this part, he says, and then thank him for all he has done. In verse four, he also says, rejoice in the Lord. Or always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. We need to learn to develop this attitude of gratitude, always being thankful, always having gratitude in our hearts because it guards against us going to God in prayer with a whiny kind of complaining spirit, which some of us, when we tell God what we need, we go to him in that way. God, it's terrible, life's terrible. You're not coming through, God. I need you to do this, God. Everything's falling apart, God, where are you? He says, the reason we have an attitude of gratitude, the reason we have an attitude of thankfulness is it guards us against having that type of attitude when we bring our request to God. It's not that we shouldn't bring our request to God, it's when we bring our request to God, we should bring our request to God with the right attitude, an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says it like this, in verse 16 through 18, it says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If some of you are looking to memorize scripture, shortest three verses in the whole Bible right there. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything. For this is the will of God, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This verse isn't saying that you need to thank God for everything, but we need to learn to thank God in everything. I want you to know there's a distinction there, right? There is a difference there. He's not saying to thank God for everything. It's not like God wants us to go around and be like, hey, thanks for the sickness. Thanks for the flu. Thanks for getting COVID. Thanks for the death in my family. Thanks for losing my job. Thanks for my pet dying. He's not saying we need to, we need to thank God for everything, but we need to learn to thank God in everything. Thing. He's saying we can learn to be thankful, to develop this attitude of gratitude in spite of our circumstances that are going on in, in our lives. We can have this attitude of gratitude no matter what's going on. Why? Because we can remember God's faithfulness. We can remember how God has come through in the past and we can be thankful and grateful in spite of everything else that's going on in our lives. In spite of the difficult circumstances, we can still come to God with our request, make our request known with the right attitude of gratitude because we can look back and see God's faithfulness. In Colossians chapter three, we're instructed like this. It says, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives, teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives, sing psalms and hymns and special songs to God with thankful hearts. And then this, he says, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. When we are thankful, our focus moves off of ourselves and our selfish desires and off of the pain of our, of our current circumstances and goes directly onto God, expressing thankfulness. It helps us remember that God is in control. How many of you have experienced that in your life? When you're going through something and then you just start to be thankful and you start to remind yourself of God's faithfulness in your life and you start to remind yourself of how he's come through before to get you through the moment you're in. Come on, anybody ever experienced that in your life? There's been times where I've literally been through a, a difficult season and I've had to remember the past, remember how God has come through, remember his faithfulness because he's always been faithful. That's why we look back, we can see that faithfulness, we can be reminded of his faithfulness in our lives. We look back and we remind ourselves of his faithfulness to help us understand and trust his, his faithfulness is gonna be in this season that we're in right now. It's not only appropriate, it's actually the only thing we should do when it comes to when it comes to our lives, it's healthy and beneficial to us to have an attitude of, of gratitude. It reminds us of the bigger picture that we belong to God, that we are his children and that he's ultimately in control no matter what we see. Ultimately in control. 
No matter when we feel out of control, everything in life feels out of control, God is still in control. It's not like he's up there going, does anybody have a manual for this? Can anybody figure out 2020, he's still in control. And we need to have an attitude of gratitude to remind ourselves that he is in control so we can simply rest in him. The fourth key we're given in this portion of scripture when it comes to dealing with stress is we need to learn to shift our thinking and our perspective. We need to change the way we, we think when it comes to stress. For most of us, the biggest battle that we have to win when it comes to stress, worry, and anxiety is right between our ears. It's in our mind. The biggest battle we have to win, the first battle that we have to often win is in our, our mind. So Paul says, this is what we need to do. He says, fix your thoughts, right? Focus your thoughts. Choose to focus on the right things. Think about things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. We have a choice when it comes to our thoughts. Some of us, we feel like we are just victims to our thoughts. No, you have a choice when it comes to your thoughts. What you think about, what you focus on, what you fix your attention on when it comes to your thoughts will determine the stress that you hold on to in your life. Bible says it like this in, in Romans 12 too. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person. By what? By changing the way you think. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five, it says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of Christ. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. The Bible is clear that the way we think as followers of Christ should be different than people who don't know Jesus, right? That's what he says in Matthew. He says, why are you so faithless? Why do you allow yourself to, to have your minds dominated by these thoughts that are the thoughts that dominate the minds of unbelievers when you are in Christ, when he promises to take care of you? We need to change the way we think. We're called to, the Bible says, take our thoughts captive and make them obedient, you understand that? There's action there. There's an action that we have to do. We take our thoughts captive and we make them obedient to the truth of God's word. And so how do we do that? We do what Paul says. We fix our thoughts on the right things. We choose to focus on the right things. Is what I'm thinking true? Is it pure? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. If it doesn't fit those categories, then we don't focus on it. We take, it, we take it captive and we make it obedient to the truth of God's words. And can I just tell you this? It's really, really hard to do this if you don't know God's word. It's really hard to do this if you're not spending time in God's word on your own. If the only, if the only bit of God's word you get is when you come to church on Sunday, that's not enough. That's not enough to sustain you. You need to spend time in God's word. So that when, when those thoughts from the enemy come that are deceptive, when those half-truths from the enemy come, you can take them, you can, you can notice them right away. Just like when Satan was tempted, in, or when, when Jesus was tempted in the garden, Satan would come at him with, with half-truths. And if Jesus didn't know God's word, he wouldn't have been able to take those thoughts captive. He, he showed us a model for dealing with temptation in that moment. We take our thoughts captive. We, we make them obedient to the truth of God's word. I love what the Bible says in Isaiah 26 about our thoughts before we move on to the last one. Isaiah 26, verse three, it says, you keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. It says, God keeps in peace, perfect peace, those whose thoughts are fixed on him. Those who choose to fix their thoughts on the right things, those who choose to think the right way, those who choose to take those wrong thoughts captive and make them obedient to the truth of God's word. You keep, if you want peace, the Bible is saying here that you need to learn to, to fix your thoughts on the right thing. And then the last thing we see that Paul gives us when it comes to dealing with stress is number five, we need to learn to be content. Some of us are so stressed out because we haven't learned the secret of being content, of how to be content in our lives. We're stressed because we're always comparing ourselves to other people. It's really, really easy in the, in the age of social media, isn't it? You look at some, how are they on vacation? I thought we weren't allowed to leave the house in 2020. Man, their life is so much better than mine. Or they're in a tropical island somewhere. I'm in my house with 10 masks on. I don't get what's going on. Comparing our pain to other people's pain, comparing our life with the highlights of someone else's life on social media. We think if we just had more, then we'd be happy. If I just had more, I'd be happy. If I had a better job, I'd be content. If I had more money, I'd be happy. If I had better behaved children, 
I'd be happy. If I had a better spouse, I'd be happy. If I had a bigger house, I'd be happy. Then I'd be content. If I had all these things, then I'd be content. But we have to realize that contentment is a learned behavior. So he goes on to say in verse 11 through 13, not that I was ever in need for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Sometimes we misuse this verse. This is what he's talking about when he talks to that. He says, I can make it through anything. I can deal with anything that life throws my way because I have Jesus. I can be content because it's Christ who gives me all that I need. Christ is my fulfillment. I don't need more stuff. All that stuff that I experienced, it's just extra. It's just cherry on top. But if you take all that away, all of it away, if I still have Jesus, I have more than I need. That's what he's saying in this portion of scripture. So we can be content when we have a lot, when things are blessed, when the bank account's extra full. We can still be content when that number is not as good. We can still be content when we're dealing with stuff, when we're dealing with that job loss. Why? Because as long as we still have Jesus, we still have more than we need. We still have enough. And he promises to give us and to provide for all of our needs. Listen, I want you to hear this. Not all of our wants. Because some of us, when we look at prayer and, and, and going to God in prayer, we, we treat Jesus like a, like a genie in a bottle. Like he got three wishes for us, right? Oh God, this way you're for Christmas. I would like a Lamborghini, if possible. And peace on earth. We'll go with peace on earth. But a Lamborghini as well, right? We have this mist. Like, no, God will provide for all of our needs, the things we need. He promises to take care of our, our needs. And sometimes, sometimes taking care of our needs is, is taking care of the bare minimum of our needs. Why? Because when we have our bare minimum of our needs met, it teaches us to rely on him more. And sometimes he gives us more than we need. And in those moments, we can still, we can still give him praise, but we can also still give him praise when we just have enough. Because we can learn to be content because we have Jesus and we have all we need. So what's the result? of putting all of this into practice that we talked about today. What's the result of actually living this out? Well, in verse seven, I wanna look back. It says this, it says, when you do these things, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You will experience, the Bible says, a peace that goes beyond your ability to understand a peace that other people aren't gonna understand why you have peace in this situation. A peace that is an extreme testimony of God's faithfulness because most of us, when, when things get bad in our lives, Jesus is nowhere to be found in our lives. But he says, when you go through difficult times, when you're suffering, when there's worry and, and you give it to God and you experience his peace, people are gonna wonder, how are you able to have peace in this moment? And it's a great testimony of God's faithfulness in your life. A peace that goes beyond your ability to understand. A peace, the Bible says, that will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. But in order to experience that peace, you actually have to live this out. Because in verse nine, he says it like this. He says, keep putting into practice what you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. In other words, information alone is not gonna help you. Like you can have all the right information, but if you don't put it into practice, it doesn't matter. That's why we say all the time, we, want, we don't wanna just be hearers of God's word, we wanna be doers of God's words because it's information plus application Walking this out that leads to transformation in our lives. We need to actually walk this out. I promise you, you will have many opportunities to walk this out this week. You're gonna have many opportunities to put into practice what we talked about today. As the worship team comes up, we're gonna get ready to close in worship. You're gonna have many, many opportunities to put into practice what we talked about today. If you're watching the Eagles this afternoon, you'll probably have a lot, of, a lot of opportunities today. Your blood pressure will be going up. You're gonna realize that they still stink. I know the Cowboys stink too. We all stink, everybody stinks. Somebody's gotta win. You're gonna have many opportunities to put this into practice. But I'll tell you this, if you don't actually learn to walk this out and actually do it, it'll have absolutely zero effect on your life. Zero. You can leave here and be like, man, that's good. The Bible's really good. It's real practical. It gives us great advice. Does nothing if we don't actually walk it out. 
Would you stand with me as we close today? Thank you guys for, uh, for being here throughout the series, for allowing us to explore this book together. Man, it's been awesome. Hopefully it's been encouraging and challenging to you. It's been encouraging and challenging to me. I just let you know every single week, 100% preaching to myself. Every single week. And God's word is living and active changes our lives when we apply it, when we walk it out, has supernatural ability in our lives when we walk it out and we apply it. I, I just wanna encourage you this week, when you're faced with stress, when you feel overwhelmed, to actually walk this out. Maybe you write these five points on a little card and you put it in your wallet, you put it on the dash of your car. Some of you could use this when you're in traffic. Give it to God, I'm about to give that person to the Lord, right? <laughs> Cut me off. Now I need to breathe. Cast my cares on the Lord for he cares for me. Do not worry. Thank God for all he has done. Learn to be content. Take my thoughts captive that don't line up with God's word, God's truth. Make them obedient to God. Maybe you're in here today. You want to experience peace. You want to experience the peace that God promises. But before you can experience the peace of God, you need to experience peace with God. The Bible says that we only experience peace with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I just tell you that if you don't know Jesus, you're not walking in, in a relationship with Christ. You're not walking surrendered to Jesus. You cannot experience the peace of God in your life. You cannot experience the peace of God until you experience peace with God. And guess what? As we've talked about throughout this entire series, Jesus already did everything possible to make that possible for you. You don't experience peace with God by making yourself worthy of peace with God, by cleaning yourself up, showing up, dressed the right way, cleaning your thoughts up, cleaning your life up. You can't do it. The Bible says that Jesus became sin for us and in exchange, when we give him our lives, when we give him our sin, when we repent and turn from our sins and turn to God, in exchange for our mess, he gives us the righteousness of God. No longer, as we talked about in this series, do we go before God with our resume of all of our good works and all the good things we've done. We go before God and he sees Jesus' resume in our place for our sins. If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus yet, what is stopping you? What is holding you back from surrendering your life to Christ? I just wanna give you an opportunity, as we do every week here, because this is the absolute most important thing we do. Every week we wanna give an opportunity for somebody that's here who doesn't know Jesus to step from death to life. That's what the Bible says happens, but you become a new creation, a new person in Christ. And you can begin that journey as following, following Christ right now in this moment. So with nobody looking around for just a moment, in fact, with every head bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to not, because this is between you and the Lord right now. If there's anybody in here who would say, today's that day. Today, I want to experience not only the peace of God, but I want to experience peace with God. I need to open my life to Jesus. I'm, I'm surrendering my life to him. I'm giving him my life today. I'm beginning to walk as a follower of Christ today. Would you just raise your hand right now so I know I'm praying with you as we close? I'm gonna look around for just a second if there's anybody in here. Somebody over on the, on the left here. Anybody else? Say yes to Jesus today. As we pray and close today, if you raised your hand or maybe you just made it, I, I just want you in your own words to surrender your life to Jesus. In your own words today, there's no magic formula that you pray. You just give your life to Christ. God, from this day forward, my life is yours. I thank you for your forgiveness for my sins. I thank you for, for dying on the cross in my place for my, my sins. God, I wanna live for you. I want my life to honor you from this day forward. I wanna live to serve you. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is going to work in my life and through my life, you're gonna give me everything I need to live for you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for, for those who made that decision today, Lord. God, I thank you that as they begin walking as far as Christ, Lord, that we could come beside them as their church. We can encourage them, disciple them, build them up, help them as they walk following you. God, I pray that you would begin to do a work in their lives that will be radical and supernatural, God, that when they leave here, they would know without a shadow of a doubt that they are changed and they are new because of you, Jesus. I pray for, for every single one of us in here that, that does know you, Jesus but that is living overwhelmed and overstressed and anxious and we are carrying burdens that we were never meant to carry. God, I pray today that we would not just be hearers of your word, but we would be doers. We would apply your word. We would actually walk this out. That God, when we feel overwhelmed and overstressed, instead of worrying about it and holding on to it, we would refuse to worry. 
We would give you our cares. We would pray about everything. We would come to you in prayer with an attitude of gratitude that we would learn to take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to the truth of your word. And we would learn to be content no matter what we're going through because we realize as long as we have you, we have everything we need. We thank you for that. As we worship you and close this series out today, we thank you that you are a good God who loves us. And we love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.